I would hope that the president means what he says when he uh, says that there should always be room for dissent. And we come to a tragic period in our nation when we equate dissent with disloyalty. These words are as timely today as when Martin Luther King spoke them on national television 40 years ago. Now, when you use the word militant, I think it is possible to be militant and yet nonviolent. I, I think I'm militant. Uh, militancy means uh, persistent, uh, to be demanding, to be insistent. For a man of peace, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. saw more than his share of war. There was the often bitter war between black America and white America. When they put me in jail, when they put Ralph, Andy, and Wyatt in jail, let them know that they got a hundred more to put in jail. There was a war within the civil rights movement itself. Martin Luther King is just a 20th century or modern Uncle Tom or a religious Uncle Tom who is doing the same thing today to keep Negroes defenseless in the face of attack that Uncle Tom did on the plantation to keep those Negroes defenseless in the, in the face of the attack of the Klan in that day. And of course, an increasingly unpopular war in a faraway place called Vietnam. Interestingly enough, when I first spoke out against the war, only 21% of the American people were against it. Both the Gallup and the Harris polls reveal now that the majority of Americans are against the war in Vietnam. And yet, despite all these powerful conflicts, Dr. King stood firm in his belief that the goals of the civil rights movement were best achieved through nonviolent methods. Violence must not come from any of us. But if we become victimized with violent intent, we will have walked in vain. Although black America's long road toward equality began with the abolition of slavery in 1865, the seeds of the modern civil rights movement were planted shortly after World War II, when President Harry Truman desegregated the army. There is no justifiable reason for discrimination because of ancestry, or religion, or race, or color. I think Truman's executive order desegregating the armed forces was really one of the uh, one of the major hallmarks in the civil rights movement that uh, began in earnest at that time and then really speeded up with the Supreme Court uh, school desegregation uh, decision in 1954 and then the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Jr. was born in Atlanta, Georgia in January of 1929. The son and grandson of Baptist ministers, he joined the ministry in 1948. In June of 1953, Dr. King married Alabama-born Coretta Scott. Together, they would have four children, all of whom would eventually become civil rights activists. The following year, Dr. King was made pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, a city that was about to dominate headlines in the fight for civil rights. As a child, uh, when I got on the bus, the sign above the driver's head read, Colored Seat from the Rear, Whites from the Front. Those who violate will be punished by law. There were in my hometown no African American bus drivers, uh, no black salespeople in downtown Greenville. Uh, we did not have the right to vote. Though my father was a veteran. Uh, we could not borrow money from, from the banks, could not work in the banks as tellers, could not own a radio or TV station or a media outlet, could not do other than menial jobs in the textile industry. So it took the form of radical, rigid apartheid, just one step above slavery. The 54 Supreme Court decision changed the, le the, the legal predicate, the legal assumptions, but the practice remains. 54 Supreme Court decision which made apartheid illegal in 1954 
was challenged in 1955 when Rosa Parks refused to go to the back of the bus. Rosa Parks' refusal to ride, go to the back of the bus might have been uh, just a, a temporary thing. I didn't know it was going to take on the proportions it did. Just the other day, uh, one of the fine citizens of our community, Mrs. Rosa Parks, was arrested because she refused to give up her seat for a white passenger. And he said, if you don't stand up, I'm going to have you arrested. And so I was arrested. He had two uh, officers, policemen, to come on the bus to escort me to the, to the jail. I didn't have to stay very long, but it was quite a humiliating way to be treated. And following uh, my uh, being arrested, the people in Montgomery decided that they would not ride the bus anymore until some changes were made. Dr. King led the call for a, a boycott on the bus company while challenging the process in court. He said to her, better that we walk in dignity than ride in chain, but it took an entire year boycott just to win that small victory in Montgomery, Alabama. We stayed off the buses 381 days. And when we did go back to the buses, we didn't have any more segregation. So in many ways, the combination of the resentment and resistance to a long train of abuses, her singular act of courage, Dr. King's presence and articulation, those forces converge. So it's like uh, Kronos, as the Greeks would say, the fullness of man's time, and Kairos, the fullness of God's time came together and exploded with new possibility. And one might call that the real birth of the modern civil rights struggle for the last half of the 20th century. In 1957, Dr. King helped create the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to fight against segregation and for civil rights. That same year, he left American soil and traveled to the newly liberated African country of Ghana. I was sent from London to cover the liberation ceremonies in Ghana. And there, I first met Richard Nixon. He got out of a plane, he was vice president, and I introduced myself. The next day at the University of Accra, outside the capital, uh, I, I met Martin Luther King. And I said, have you ever met the vice president? He said, I've asked for an, uh, an appointment, but it hasn't been come through. I said, well, you're going to have one now. He's right around on the other side. I just left him. So I'd brought them together and introduced them to one another. And they became friends until King was locked up in Berlin and Robert Kennedy got King out and they switched sides then. No more Nixon, they were for Kennedy. Dr. King continued to spread his message of peace, culminating on August 28, 1963, when more than a quarter of a million people marched to the Lincoln Memorial to rally for civil rights. When I participated in the march to Washington, my wife and I came down on a school bus. It was a real rough ride. But to see so many people coming down in all types of vehicles, waving and showing a sense of camaraderie. To see the masses uh, located there at the Washington Monument, there was an electricity that made me feel America like I never, never, never felt it before. There was a mixture of every color that you can see in a mosaic. There were Jews and Christians and Catholics and Protestants. And there was a feeling that we have known each other for years. And the silence when Dr. Martin Luther King started to speak. I went and lay down on the cold marble of the Lincoln Memorial to take a nap. It was a very hot day. And uh, this voice came, the voice just came rising like waves from the ocean. 
I have a dream this day, and it was so enthralling, I jumped up and ran to my telephone and called New York and said, you got to get this. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. I also remember seeing um, Martin Luther King, and I remember his speeches and the marches, and more so than what I got when I watched Martin, because I was Martin Luther King, I was such a, a young kid, but what I do remember is the impact that his image and his words on television had on my family, that there was so much electricity in my house whenever he was mentioned on television. You know, the strange thing about human nature is that there were so many Americans, black and white, that resented Dr. King, and they didn't want him to come to Washington, and they boycotted the affair, and they called him a communist. Thank God for time, because now no one's heard of these people. Now he's a martyr. But it's shameful that you have to die to be respected sometimes. But even though uh, the federal government generally resisted that march. It, more than anything, is responsible for the creation of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. It struck the conscience of the Congress. They knew that uh, this group that had marched to listen to Dr. King didn't represent Harlem or Bed-Stuy or Chicago, but represented America. And America is the better for it. We got such a long way to go. But I think that was the first giant step since the abolition of slavery. After President Kennedy was assassinated in November of 1963, President Johnson pledged to continue the fight for civil rights legislation. President Johnson has made it clear to me in private a conversation that I've had with him in the last few months, that uh, he is committed to civil rights generally and to the Civil Rights Bill in particular that is now before Congress. He met the civil rights question head on. He put it into legislation, and the legislation is stuck. And it sticks because he stopped campaigning for passing the laws. He knew he could, they could be passed. He began calling in sheriffs and governors from all over the South and telling them, you've got to organize this so it works. I signed a message to the Congress. That message called for the enactment, and I quote, of the first effective federal law against discrimination in the sale and the rental of housing in the United States of America. And so it took us a Montgomery bus boycott to 1964 to get public accommodations. Uh, but then we didn't have the right to vote. And in that struggle, Medgar Evers was killed. The four babies were born in the Birmingham church. Uh, Viola Luizzo, an Italian-American mother, was killed. Schroeder Goodman and Cheney were killed. Uh, and scores of, of men and women were killed mothers in the struggle for the right to vote. And the right to vote did not come from the White House down, or the courts, or the Congress. It came from massive street protests and jailings. So that is why Dr. King was so fundamental as a leader change agent, because under his leadership, from that came a public accommodations bill that changed the law the right to vote. Civil rights, uh, basically the FBI became heavily involved uh, about the same time the country became heavily involved, which would be the, the uh, early 60s. And throughout the 60s, uh, put a great deal of effort and manpower into it. Uh, down in the South with the investigation of the murders of the civil rights workers and, and so on. This must never happen again in Birmingham or anywhere in the state of Alabama, but they are here. We must never forget that. 
And so don't allow our struggle here in Birmingham to degenerate into a racial struggle. And yet, despite the brutal murders and savage police beatings, Dr. King remained steadfast in his endorsement of a nonviolent response. We can be sure that the vast majority of Negroes who engage in the demonstrations and who uh, understand the nonviolent uh, philosophy will be able to face dogs and all of the other brutal uh, methods that are used without retaliating with violence because they understand that one of the first uh, principles of nonviolence is a willingness to be the recipient of violence while never uh, inflicting violence upon another. But not everyone in the civil rights movement agreed with Dr. King's pacifist approach. The white man pays Reverend Martin Luther King, subsidizes Reverend Martin Luther King, so that Reverend Martin Luther King can continue to teach the Negroes to be defenseless. That's what you mean by nonviolent. Be defenseless. Be defenseless in the face of one of the most cruel uh, beasts that has ever taken the people into captivity. That's this American white man. And they have proved it throughout the country by the police dogs and the police club. In December of 1964, Dr. King's advocacy of nonviolence earned him the Nobel Prize for Peace. Presentation of this award also brings with it a demand for deepening one's commitment to nonviolence as a philosophy of life. But receiving an award for advocating peace and actually achieving peace were not necessarily the same thing there were still many miles to travel on the road to equal rights. We marched in Chicago in 1966 for open housing. We could only live in certain blocks, and there were many homes in Chicago where blacks had to live in the back, in the maids' quarters. They were called restrictive covenant agreements on houses. And just after Dr. King was killed, the outlawing housing discrimination as a matter of law take place. It still exists, but no longer as a matter of law. It proclaims that fair housing for all, all human beings who live in this country is now a part of the American way of life. Dr. King's increasing influence and visibility brought him into contact with more than just politicians and world leaders. Martin Luther King spent some time at the mansion in Chicago, and uh, we had some extended conversations. Uh, certainly a man who changed his time and uh, provided a leadership that uh, was really unique, and one realizes how unique after he was gone. It is remarkable because so much of history one thinks is somehow apart from the, the individuals uh, living it. But the reality is that sometimes single people can make a tremendous difference in, uh, in the, the times, and uh, he's a classic example of that. Well, certainly during the tumultuous 60s, you had uh, black awareness raging of course, with the, the Black Panther movement. Uh, of course, Dr. King had been assassinated in 1968. Uh, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated in 68, and uh, assassinated in 1965 was Malcolm X and Megar Evers in 63. So tumultuous times, and that there was only one way to be black in certain minds. And uh, we are such a diverse people, you know, doing all of the things that anyone else in society has done or will ever do. I don't see the answer to our problem in riots. So my slogan is not burn, baby, burn. My slogan is build, baby, build. Organize, baby, organize. Learn, baby, learn, so that you can earn, baby, earn. That's my slogan. Dr. King may have been a man of peace, but he was hardly passive. His experience as a Baptist minister served him well in his crusade. When they put me in jail, when they put Ralph and then Wyatt in jail, 
Let them know that they got a hundred more to put in jail. When they put that next hundred in jail, let them know that they got another thousand to put in jail. When they put that thousand in jail, let them know that they got 10,000 more to put in jail. Another hot button issue, which Dr. King was passionate about, was the war in Vietnam a conflict that was dividing the nation into pro-war hawks and anti-war doves. The aim is to build a powerful peace bloc that can really have influence in the 1968 elections. And we must make it clear that we aren't gonna let our political forces and the politicians ignore Vietnam in 1968. This must be an issue if that tragic war is still going on. And so as the war hawks escalate the war in Vietnam, we must escalate our protest against the war. We're afraid of anything that's different. And until we conquer that fear, until we can look at something that doesn't look like us and not have preconceived notions about who and what that is, we're always going to be in the middle of a war of some sort or another. I came to the Senate in January of 1967. I was elected in November of 1966. And in many ways, that was the very height of the conflict over the internal conflict here in this country over the war in Vietnam. You know, as I look back on it, that's still the most turbulent, difficult time in my public experience. I can still see the faces and the hatred that went uh, before some of the anti-war demonstrations. And that's not to say that they were without merit, but it is to say that there was, an, there was a, a feeling in this country of, of absolute hatred among individuals, by individuals against the government, against the government against individuals. It, it just was a terrible time. And to this day, I can, I can, I can still call up and feel the, the, uh, the, the hatreds that uh, permeated our public life at the time. The American people had lost, lost faith in that war effort and could no longer see a clear purpose or a clear mission. And we were no longer just advisors, it was now our war. And we were losing lots of young Americans fighting in a war that it was increasingly clear would be difficult to win. Walter Cronkite was right. He said the war is unwinnable after a while. He had been for it too. And I oppose the war in Vietnam because I love America. I speak out against it, not in anger, but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart, and above all, with a passionate desire to see our beloved country stand as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I am disappointed with America. Later that year, Dr. King brought his anti-war message to The Mike Douglas Show, where he defended his views against some surprisingly tough questions from the affable host, and an equally unlikely adversary, singer Tony Martin. Here is Dr. King in his historic appearance, which seems remarkably relevant after 40 years. Tony, our next guest is the, is the winner of the Nobel Prize for Peace, and perhaps the foremost spokesman for uh, the nine nonviolent faction uh, in the American Negro Civil Rights Movement. Now, his recent speeches and sermons urging Negroes not to fight in Vietnam have initiated a verbal argument among prominent Negroes that threatens to split the civil rights movement wide open. Would you please welcome a very outstanding and controversial gentleman, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. <laughs> I said to Dr. King, I want to put you right in the middle. I wasn't thinking. You've been put in the middle quite, <laughs> quite often, right. haven't you? That's quite right. Dr. King, uh, why did you decide to urge Negroes not to fight in Vietnam? Well, I think my view has uh, been a little distorted at that point. I haven't only urged Negroes not to fight. Uh, I feel that the war is so unjust, so abominable, so futile and bloody and costly 
that no, nobody should be fighting that. I have limited my concern to just the American Negro, although I know we are dying in disproportionate numbers there, and uh, we are on the losing end both there and at home, because as long as the war in Vietnam continues, uh, social programs will inevitably suffer here at home. Well, don't you think that your remarks have created doubts about the Negro's loyalty to his country? Well, some people may feel that. I don't think our loyalty to the country should be measured by our ability to kill. I think our loyalty to the country should be measured by our ability to lead the nation to higher heights of democracy and to the great dream of justice and humanity. Do you, you honestly feel, uh, Dr. King, that the war in Vietnam could be stopped now without harm to this country? Well, there are two ways to deal with it. Uh, one is a unilateral withdrawal. Uh, I don't oppose that because uh, I feel that this is a possibility. After all, France withdrew unilaterally from Algeria. It withdrew without a military victory. Mm -hmm. And this did not lessen France's prestige or influence in the world. If anything, it increased its prestige but in France the world. France is not the power that this country is. Well, I think that's an even greater reason why uh, we should restrain our power. Uh, there's always the danger that any nation will abuse its power. And uh, I think our power must be much more than military power. We don't need to prove to the world or anybody our military power, I think we've got to prove our moral power. Do now. you feel that this nation has abused, uh, as you say, uh, their power? Oh, I certainly do in the, in the war in Vietnam. I have no doubt about that. I'm not saying that it was done uh, with evil motives in mind. I think we made a huge miscalculation. And when you make a mistake, you ought to confess it. One of the great things about President Kennedy was that he said to the world, to his closest advisors that he made a mistake in the Bay of Pigs invasion oh, yes. in Cuba, and he said, I never should have listened to the experts. And I think the time has come now for our leaders to say that we've made a grave mistake in Vietnam, and we ought to take the initiative in bringing an end to this conflict, if not through a unilateral withdrawal, at least through a negotiated settlement. And I think there are things that we can do to create the atmosphere for negotiation. You know, uh, Dr. King, my first question, when you said uh, uh, it was, uh, you didn't say it was inaccurate, but you said it was a misunderstanding that you didn't advise just Negroes not to fight in Vietnam. But I think it was interpreted that way. Now, uh, how about the heroic uh, Negroes already in Vietnam? Uh, don't your remarks belittle their accomplishments? Oh, not at all. Uh, I have nothing but admiration for the bravery of those uh, who are engaged in the kind of sacrificial and suffering situation uh, that they are in. I'm not dealing with uh, their particular situation in terms of fighting. I'm trying to do something, uh, trying to lead us somewhere that will bring an end to what I see as a terrible and a very tragic war, which is damaging the image of our nation here and abroad. Doctor, may I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, don't you feel that perhaps the parents of, of the boys who are now currently in the operation in Vietnam might uh, not be in uh, amity with your civil rights movement now because of your... I doubt that. Uh, I doubt that very seriously. Uh, I can't uh, overestimate the amount of discontent in the Negro community over the war in Vietnam. Uh, I haven't seen any loss of support in the Negro community. I don't mean just in the Negro community. I mean, there are many, many of the Caucasians who are with mm -hmm. your civil rights movement as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you're not disingratiating yourself, how you feel about those who have their sons in Vietnam now. Well, there again, I think two things are important here. Uh, first, I think that uh, the things that I'm saying and the things that I'm trying to do and all of the people in the move peace movement are trying to do are really geared toward uh, bringing the boys back home. In other words, we are trying to prove to be their best friends by uh, 
uh, doing something to bring about the climate that will bring an end to this war. Uh, secondly, anyone who is committed to civil rights would not withdraw that commitment as a result of uh, someone in the civil rights movement taking a stand against the war in Vietnam. And if they do, then they were not with it in the beginning. You stand up for what is just because it is just and right. Uh, I think it was T.S. Eliot who said, there's no greater heresy than to do the right thing for the wrong reason. That's right. And a lot of people do the right thing for the wrong reason. And I submit to anyone who would stop supporting civil rights because of a stand against the war on the part of some leaders ended up doing the right thing for the wrong reason. They were never truly committed to civil rights in the beginning. Dr. King, Carl Rowan, our former ambassador to Finland, has said that uh, your statements against uh, uh, Negro participation in the war have, and I, and I quote, alienated many of the Negro's friends and armed the Negro's foes. Now, what is your comment on that statement? But I'm sorry to have to disagree very vigorously with uh, uh, Mr. Rowan on that. I go back to the same uh, statement that uh, people who have been alienated as a result of this uh, stand against the war were alienated anyway. Uh, many people supported us in civil rights when we were in Selma or Birmingham because they were against the brutality of a Bull Connor. Uh, Jim Clark, and they were deeply outraged about these things. Uh, and they supported us because they were against that brutality, not because they were for genuine equality for the Negro. And uh, if anybody's been alienated, it's been because they were really not absolutely committed to the ideal of genuine equality for the Negro. And any little excuse that comes along, they will use that. But the basic thing is that they were not committed anyway. This equality for the Negro that you mentioned, how much longer are the Negro people willing to wait for this equality, which is certainly do them? Well, uh, the mood in the Negro community, as you know, is a mood of uh, great disappointment and despair and even bitterness as a result of the slow pace of progress and as a result of the fact that in some instances, things have gotten worse, particularly in the economic area. And I think the uh, impatience is very deep and uh, the discontent is very broad. And if something isn't done with haste to remove the intolerable conditions that exist in our communities all over the nation, then I see us sinking into darker nights of social disruption. Doctor, do you believe that your remarks have put a strain on the relations of the civil rights movement, you believe so? Well, not uh, not really. As I said, uh, many people, white and Negro, are deeply opposed to the war in Vietnam. Interestingly enough, when I first spoke out against the war, only 21% of the American people were against it. Both the Gallup and the Harris polls reveal now that the majority of Americans are against the war in Vietnam. Some 48% are now opposed to the war in Vietnam. 10% remain undecided. And you have about 42% who are still in favor. So you have a majority opposed to the war in Vietnam. And I haven't seen the great opposition uh, to my position that uh, so many people... But state, the other thing is that a man of conscience can never be a consensus leader. He doesn't take a stand in order to search for consensus. He's ultimately a molder of consensus. And I've always said that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and moments of convenience, but where he stands in moments of challenge and moments of controversy. And I would take this position even if I didn't have a majority of people agreeing with me now. Using your feeling about unilateral and the way France settled, which mm -hmm. was very well done, they didn't lose face. Apparently, face is the important thing at this time. But not only are we losing face, but it would be better to save lives. We know that. Mm -hmm. Who will be the GOAT if someone takes upon themselves to end this war and settle it unilaterally? Will there be a constant complaint? What a big waste this one. Will this set a precedent for the United States in the future of defending our inheritance, our independence? 
Well, I think we have to look at several things here. First, in my mind, peace is much more important than faith. And I think there has to be a transformation here in terms of our thinking uh, and in terms of, of peace. We've got to come to see now that peace must not only be a goal that we talk about and seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. The other thing is this, that even though the mood of the country may not be in line with the unilateral withdrawal now, I think there are things that can be done to bring about a negotiated settlement. Now, there are many people uh, who have talked very closely with the leaders of North Vietnam and the National Liberation Front who tell us if we bring about an unconditional halt in the bombings, this would get talks going. Uh, our government has refused to do that. And I feel that since we took the initiative in escalating the war in the air and on the land and on the seas, then we have a moral obligation to take the initiative uh, to de-escalate it. And I think we can do that by bringing about a halt to the bombings. And our security is involved. Do you think, do you think that involved. that would do it, by halting the bombing? Would that do it? Well, as I would said, bring about I, I can only go by men like you, Tom, uh, the Russian leaders, and many other people who have talked very closely with uh, the leadership of North Vietnam and the National Liberation Front. I think we ought to try it anyway. I think we ought to bring about an unconditional halt uh, to the bombings, and we should do that for practical reasons in terms of trying to get talk started, and I think we should do it for moral reasons. They are never going to negotiate as long as we are bombing that territory. How about your relationship with uh, President Johnson? Have you lost favor with uh, Mr. Johnson? Well, I guess the president would have to answer that question. Uh, I have taken a position against the administration's policy, and uh, I would hope that the president means what he says when he uh, says that there should always be room for dissent. And we come to a tragic period in our nation when we equate dissent with disloyalty. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe firmly uh, that uh, it is necessary to have these moments of dissent in order to challenge something that may be leading the whole nation do down you, the wrong do path. Do you care if you have lost favor with Mr. Johnson? Well, that isn't, uh, I guess, the most important thing to me. The important thing is that I not lose favor with truth and with what conscience tells me is right and what conscience tells me is just. I'm much more concerned about keeping favor with these principles than keeping favor with a person who may misunderstand the position I take. We will talk further with Dr. Martin Luther King following these messages. We'll be right back. Dr. King, if I may, I found this in this morning's paper. Negroes hail results of Dr. King's policy. Berkeley, California, more than four out of five American Negroes believe the nonviolence of Dr. Martin Luther King has done the most to help their race, a study reveals. But about half of the same Negroes interviewed for a University of California study believe riots have done some good. Findings which include interviews with 1,119 Negroes were released in a book titled Protest and Prejudice. Author Gary T. Marks, now assistant sociology professor at Harvard University, reports the majority of Negroes seem to direct their hatred and anger toward the system of evil and those who support it not, disc not, not disc indiscriminately against all whites. Can you comment on that article? Yes, I uh, am very interested in hearing that. I, I hadn't read the article and I hadn't... Uh, read the book. In fact, I wasn't aware of it. But I think uh, it is true that the vast majority of Negroes uh, feel that the best way to resolve the problem is uh, to work through peaceful, nonviolent means uh, and, and militant nonviolence, but not through uh, violence. Now, on the question of whether riots have uh, helped, uh, I've taken the position that uh, riots are socially destructive and self-defeating, and therefore I have to take a stand against it because of my deep commitment uh, to nonviolence. On the other hand, I do think a riot is the language of the unheard. Uh, and America has failed to hear, for instance, that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last 10 or 15 years. I think it has also failed to hear that uh, large segments of white society are more 
committed uh, to tranquility and the status quo than to justice and humanity and equality. And in that sense, I think the riots have called attention to something. Not that they have brought about social transformation, but they've called attention to a very serious problem uh, in our society. But I couldn't say that they have been helpful in the sense of really bringing about structural change. I haven't seen any basic change that has come through riots. The changes that uh, we have made and the changes that we've seen over the last 10 or 12 years have come through powerful watershed nonviolent movements. Well, have the um, militant leaders taken over the civil rights movement, in your opinion? Well, there again, I think a, a poll like this reveals that uh, most Negroes are still following the leadership of those who feel that the problem must be worked out uh, through nonviolence. After all, uh, riots have been engaged in by a very small number of Negroes. When you think of the fact that there are some 22 million Negroes in uh, the United States. Now, when you use the word militant, I think it is possible to be milit militant and yet nonviolent. I, I think I'm militant. Uh, militancy means uh, persistent, uh, to be demanding, to be insistent. Uh, and I think it's possible to be militantly nonviolent. And these, I think, are going to be the leaders who will lead us through this very tense period of transition. Mm -hmm. Doctor, uh, what do you think of the approach of this... Uh, Sophie Carmichael and the H. Rap Brown. Well, uh, naturally, there are philosophical uh, disagreements I have with both uh, Mr. Carmichael and uh, Mr. Brown. But I always have to Could say... Have discuss these disagreements with them? Oh, very definitely. Uh, I know them very well. Do they we agree with you? We together in the movement a good deal, and uh, I'm sure they would disagree with me on a number <laughs> of things. In other words, but they're, not, they're, they're not too friendly with you sometimes. Well, that's quite right. Uh, but in answering the question about them, I always go beyond them because I think they are products of the problem rather than causes of the problem. And I always have to think of the fact that it's very easy to take our visions from the causal basis, from the, the root of the problem, and see the consequence out here and begin to uh, major on that. Neither Rab Brown nor Stokely Carmichael created slavery. They did not create slums. They did not create unemployment or underemployment. They did not create segregated or qualityless schools. And they didn't start a war in Vietnam. Uh, these things uh, were started by other forces in our society. It was Victor Hugo who said once, where there is darkness, crimes will be committed. The guilty one is not merely he who commits the crime, but he who caused the darkness. And I think we have to admit that these men didn't cause the darkness. They are the products of the darkness. How, how, about, their bitterness. how about their following? Uh, do they have a growing or important following uh, among American Negroes? Well, I would say uh, uh, among the young population, there are those who are listening more to uh, Mr. Carmichael and Mr. Brown. I wouldn't say that they have a large following. I still think it's a, a minority. But if conditions do not change, if they are not uh, made better, and if programs do not emerge that really go all out, to get rid of the depth of, uh, deprivation surrounding the life of the Negro, uh, then they will probably have a greater appeal. What will this do to the power of Dr. Martin Luther King at that point? <laughs> well, I uh, never like to discuss uh, Martin Luther King's influence for fear that that is uh, suggestive of, uh, of your modesty. Uh, I'm just trying to do a job, and I think it's a job that has to be done. And I'm not trying to do it merely for myself, or merely for my children, or merely for the Negro, but uh, for America. Because I think it's true that if this problem isn't solved, uh, the soul of our nation uh, will be lost. And the only way to redeem the soul of America is to remove or to eradicate racism in all of its dimensions. Dr. King, in the past you've been accused of having communist sympathies, and since your stand has to help the communist cause, uh, aren't you concerned that, those, that these allegations will be revived? Well, they're always uh, revived. I hate that 
McCarthy years tend to live with us. Uh, but I don't really worry about this. Uh, I know my own views Are you a too well. Are you a communist Absolutely sympathizer? Absolutely not. I have never been. I am not now, and I never will be in terms of the philosophy of communism. I happen to be a, a Baptist preacher, and I don't think you'd find too many Baptist preachers who would be communists. <laughs> I think communism is based on a metaphysical materialism and a kind of ethical relativism and a and a crippling totalitarianism and a denial of certain human freedoms that I consider basic, First Amendment uh, freedoms that I consider so basic that I could never be a communist or prefer the communist way of life. But I do feel that we've got to recognize the fact that communism is in the world and we're going to either have to have peaceful coexistence or violent co-annihilation. Dr. King, uh, we have certainly... Uh, appreciated your stopping by today. We have enjoyed this visit very much. And thank, thank you so much. Enjoy meeting you. Mark Luther King, we'll be right back. In addition to his anti war stance, Dr. King supported a boycott of the 1968 Olympics. This is a protest and a struggle against racism and injustice, and this is what we are working to eliminate in our organization and in our total struggle. I would also like to commend the outstanding athletes who have the courage and the kind of determination to make it clear that they will not participate in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City unless something is done about these terrible problems, these terrible evils and injustices. Freedom always demands sacrifice. Sadly, the ultimate sacrifice was fast approaching. Dr. King's speech in Memphis the night before his murder was an eerie foreshadowing of things to come. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. On April 4th, 1968, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot dead while standing on the balcony of a Memphis motel. He was 39 years old. In a cruel irony, the sudden brutal death of a man who devoted his life to spreading peace caused just the sort of violence he would have denounced. The day that Martin Luther King was killed, Washington burned. And we walked from FBI headquarters to the parking lots to get our cars wearing our weapons for the first time maybe because we had really no reason to carry the weapon although it was issued to us and we expected if we we're on, on call but since we were administrators we were not on call that much but I remember uh, actually being for the first time in my life concerned about my safety walking from the FBI building to the parking lot because of the fact that uh, the rioting and the burning of Washington DC sort of frightened the younger children to see soldiers standing on their corners and wondering if they were going to actually shoot people and were we really going to have a war. And I think this was very, very frightening to the young children. I had an interesting story from a fifth grader. I don't think the white people in Washington, D.C. should be faulted for what happened in Memphis. I say that we are not hurting the whites. We are hurting ourselves by burning down the stores and looting. Here's an interesting comment from another fifth grader who was talking about Martin Luther King. His dream wasn't like most dreams. It wasn't just him in the dream. He wanted everybody in his dream. He wanted to take us to the promised land with him. Now he has left for the promised land and we have to follow. We have to do as he would have wanted us to do. We have to finish what he worked so hard for. I sat in my office in the Dirksen office building on the Senate side of the Capitol and watched the downtown part of Washington, D.C. burning. It's all smoke coming up from F Street, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th Street, Pennsylvania Avenue. It was absolute chaos. I saw troops in the street. I remember uh, my family and I lived 
in northwest Washington in a quiet wooded neighborhood and I remember waking up at two or three in the morning to the clank of tanks what turned out to be armored personnel carriers through the streets. I don't know where they were going to this day but at the incongruity of seeing that in the national capital in a quiet part of that city was just overwhelming. This country was on the ragged edge. It was on the ragged edge of uh, socially coming apart. Despite the violent reaction to Dr. King's death, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, the new head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, reaffirmed the dream as he eulogized his fallen friend. We thank God for giving us a leader who was willing to die, but not willing to kill. Peace be to his ashes and rest to his soul. Although his dynamic voice may have been silenced, Dr. King's powerful influence continued to be felt across geographical and generational boundaries. On July 17, 1960, we were jailed, trying to use the public library. July 17, 1960. It stands out in my mind because July 17, 1984, 24 years to the day I was addressing the Democratic Convention in San Francisco. So from the jail cell to the platform at that convention was 24 years to, to the day. I read Malcolm X, but I also read Martin Luther King. And you understand that one benefited the other. There, there's always the yin and the yang in the politic of, of cultures and developing countries. And ours is a developing country. We're just coming to the point where we're going to have leaders of state, a la Colin Powell, that heretofore people wouldn't even imagine. It takes pressure. It takes marching, it takes demonstrating, it takes, it takes those forces that make a democracy work. But the fact that I, we could go from 1963 where I can't get a hamburger in a, in a southern restaurant to 1989 where I become chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and it was with that year or the next year that I went back to that same community and had a street named in my honor, uh, that's remarkable progress. Remarkable progress. Few nations on the face of the earth could make progress like that with that kind of a social, racial, ethnic, you call it, problem. We should be very proud of what we're able to do. The danger is thinking it's all done. I've known Marlon Brando for a long time, since 1951, when we were really in the heat of serious battlefields with a lot of other, hundreds of thousands of other people in America. And he said to me a couple of years ago, he says, I can't believe after all the crap we went through in the 50s and 60s and 40s, you know, that here it's in 1998, almost 1999, that in some ways is worse than it ever was before. Hello is not a, um, a small factor in how we see African policy. It's still Taz and Jane Boy versus the natives. That's how basic African policy orientation, it's still cowboys and Indians. It's still uh, Hispanics and the sombrero uh, in the siesta under the tree. It means so much of the negative garbage that has separated Americans from Americans has come in the form of, of entertainment. The headquarters has been Hollywood and not Washington. And we're still sort of participating in it in here and in here. And until we can eradicate it from in here and in here, we'll continue to act out and, and, and play out those roles that took us generations to sort of create. There's all types of entertainment. But you are making a statement when you say that this group of people can only represent this percentage of entertainment. That's a problem. I don't think America is comfortable with black folks being just normal people with the everyday kind of problems that everybody else deals with. The civil rights movement, you know, which should truly be um, our breast milk. That's what we should have been, that's what we were nurtured on. That should be so a part of us that, you know what, if it's going to take months and months and years 
we're going to do that. America may have many, many days, but they will be full of trouble. There will be no rest. There will be no tranquility in this country until the nation comes to terms with our problems. But, but civil rights are clearly, uh, I think, it one of the top priorities so that they have to, has to be dealt with in this country because the ethnic uh, uh, diversification in this country is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day. It is, you know. It's not just about black and white anymore. You know, it's Hispanic, it's Asian. You know, it's it's uh, uh it's, it's it is the melting pot, and that's what America was, was supposed to be proud of. But we better live up to our promise. I often say, as as I look back, that against such great odds, we made progress. And some people become cynical because there's yet more territory to cover. To put it this way, we've won everything we fought for, but don't have what we need. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., man of peace in a time of war, and for all time.